Welcome, everyone. It's great seeing so many of you this evening. Uh, training today's large language models and other deep learning workloads often involves several thousand GPUs and can take multiple million GPU hours of time. The coordinated nature of training also makes resilience in the system not just a nice to have, but an essential quality. Today, we'll share how to detect, manage, and mitigate GPU and network issues for building resilience. And while these techniques are critical at large scales, they also bring many valuable aspects to running a wide range of smaller workloads. I'm Ganesh, and I'm a software engineer in the Azure Kubernetes service team at Microsoft. I primarily work on GPU workload management and also pod startup time as part of the Node Lifecycle team. We make it easy to run AI training and inference workload, uh, along with many other types of workloads on Kubernetes. Uh, I'm Ace. I'm a software engineer at Cohere. We build large language models. Uh, I work on both our training and serving infrastructure. Oh, one one better. Yeah. Yeah. In today's talk, we'll start with a brief background on running AIML workloads on Kubernetes, talk about why job communication between different nodes and GPUs is very critical, then discuss about the various types of errors that can happen, and show you a demo on how failure can be managed as well uh, when this happens at the application layer. Then from the infra provider perspective, we'll talk about how you can both proactively detect and manage errors through uh, components like node problem detector and remedy controllers, and we'll show a demo of this in action. Finally, we'll touch upon briefly about advanced scenarios and developments in the field around how you can make this more uh, native to Kubernetes and better from the end user perspective. Uh, so a little bit of background. Uh, if you're here, you probably know something about LLMs. You probably heard about ChatGPT. Let's go back. Um, so models are getting bigger. They're hungrier for more data, more compute to train them. Uh, and we use Kubernetes to run these jobs. Uh, and these are jobs that span multiple pods, multiple nodes. Like Ganesh mentioned, it could be thousands of GPUs. Um, but these are one unit of work. So we want them scheduled as a unit. Uh, we don't want any deadlocks where, where a job is partially scheduled. Uh, you might hear about things like Volcano or Q that support this kind of behavior today. Um, you'll also hear about framework-specific abstractions. So if you've heard of Kubeflow, you might hear about like MPI job, PyTorch job. Um, there's some coordination that's required for these jobs to run across multiple nodes, multiple pods, often things like a coordinator address, uh, the pod index within the job. Um, so many different framework-specific abstractions for Kubernetes uh, provide that kind of wrapping layer um, on top of the frameworks themselves. Uh, more recently, we're seeing kind of generalized approaches, so things like job sets, leader worker sets, uh, where they're providing some of the same primitives from the infrastructure side, from the Kubernetes side. Um, so that the frameworks don't need to implement kind of the same thing over and over again. Um, so LLM training in general, uh, we want to shard our model state and our weights and stuff like that, distribute it across all these workers, and then we want to pump as much data through all these GPUs as quickly as we can, basically. Um, we can't do that fully independently between all these different pods. Uh, they do need to coordinate a little bit. They need to synchronize gradients and weights between steps. Um, you'll hear a lot about Nickel if people are training on NVIDIA GPUs, NVIDIA's collective communications library. Um, it's basically used for, for all this kind of communication between workers. Um, digging into that a little bit, this is kind of an example diagram of what uh, we'd call fully sharded data parallel training. Um, this might look a little bit different depending on what your AI training, training looks like, uh, what kind of parallelization techniques you use. Um, this is an example from Meta, but if you see those dotted lines kind of in the second, fourth, and sixth box, uh, that's the communication that I was talking about. Um, and those are collective communication operations across many nodes. Again, depends how you're sharding, uh, but you can see there's an all gather, uh, actually two all gathers, and a reduced scatter in this example. Um, so what do those actually do? Um, this is kind of what those look like up close. Uh, the reduced scatter is the second one there, the all gather is the third one. Um, so really these are just ways of shuffling data around uh, across different GPUs. Um, and taking a quick look back at this loop, 
Uh, this is one training step, this whole diagram, and so you would repeat this like many, many times uh, over the course of a model training lifecycle. Um, so you really want those collective communication operations to be fast so that you have good step time when you're training. So this is kind of the background. Uh, what goes wrong? Like what kind of failures are we talking about? Uh, I break them down into a couple different categories. Uh, I would say the first category is things that are hard failures. Uh, typically this will immediately fail the job, like the job will die naturally. You don't really need to do anything to intervene to, to make forward progress. Uh, this might be stuff like physical GPU memory errors, uh, ECC errors. Uh, it could also be networking errors or things like driver issues. Um, these are all very common, I would say. There's also soft failures where the job continues to make progress, but maybe it's slower. Uh, the best example of this is something like ne low network throughput. Uh, where those collective communication steps might be a lot slower than you would expect from the hardware that you have. The last category is kind of somewhere in between, um, where maybe the application doesn't die naturally like in some of those hard failure cases. Uh, maybe it hangs, but uh, you know, it's not really making forward progress in terms of training. Um, often these could come down to CUDA errors or nickel errors that are not necessarily handled correctly. Um, there are also more insidious things, I would say, like silent data corruption. Um, this is kind of a risk that happens with GPUs that we don't really see as much with CPUs. Um, and it's something that you need to be aware of at the application level to handle correctly. Um, just to highlight, this is from one of Meta's recent papers. Uh, you've probably seen some of these diagrams if you're interested in this kind of stuff. Um, but it just breaks down the types of failures that we see typically in training. Um, and I would say, kind of like I mentioned before, GPU, like network issues, uh, those definitely dominate in terms of kind of the, the scale that we see. So kind of take an example of a, what I would call a soft failure. Uh, this is something that we saw where we did see step time increased, but it only happened at specific job size. So, you know, uh, when we're talking about like these large scale jobs, we see a degradation in performance that we don't see at smaller scales. Um, so NVIDIA does have some nice tests that you can do to test these kind of collective communication operations. Um, so you can just run an all reduce on all your GPUs and see what the bandwidth is. And based on the hardware that you have and based on the algorithm you're running, you should know what kind of expected performance uh, you, you hope to get. Um, so in this case, it turned out that uh, based on the network topology, there are many parameters that you can tune with Nickel. Um, and in particular, we had a rail line topology where GPUs are connected to particular uh, NICs to particular switches. Uh, and the topology detection that Nickel uses internally did not work correctly at the scale that we were running at. Um, this screenshot is not exactly the bug that, was, uh, that we hit, but this is from the latest release of Nickel about two months ago. Um, and it's just to highlight that these things are still rapidly evolving. NVIDIA is still adding features, fixing bugs, all that kind of stuff. Um, but you do hit a lot of rough edges, I would say. Uh, just highlighting again, like you, there is kind of a standard, so you know what you should get um, based on the hardware that you have. And again, they have these very nice tests that you can run upstream. Uh, it's a great GitHub repo, so. So uh, this is kind of how we would debug something like this. Like let's say we know that that step time is slow. We think it's a network issue. We're trying to debug like where, where something is going wrong. Uh, I mentioned MPI job earlier. So you can use MPI job to run those nickel tests across nodes. Uh, so this is an example just with uh, eight workers. Each of those workers has eight GPUs, so they take a full node. Uh, and then we have a launcher pod. Uh, and that launcher pod basically runs the job across all the actual workers. Um, so this is pretty neat. If you're not familiar with uh, MPI run or OpenMPI, um, this is actually like you're SSHing into all these pods and like coordinating. Um, so if you're writing this pod spec from scratch, you would have to add like all these volumes and secrets yourself. And this is kind of what the output of that looks like. Uh, these are nodes with 400 gigabytes per node uh, a second. Um, so we're expecting to see kind of close to the line right there, and we're, we're getting pretty close, so this is reasonable. Um, so far, we've been talking about kind of soft failure, this nickel uh, issue. Um, so what about hard failure? Like, what if we're doing one of these collective operations and a GPU just dies? Like, it's gone. It's not coming back. The hardware's busted for whatever reason. Uh, usually the whole job dies, and if we're talking about a job with thousands of GPUs, you know, that's thousands of dollars potentially wasted, uh, depending how long you're running for. Um, so what can we do about that? Um, we can do a couple different things. In the application layer, uh, we typically checkpoint progress and restore progress after restarts or failures. Um, so that's very standard. That's kind of how all uh, AI training works at scale. 
Um, and then I did mention there's kind of these more insidious issues that we need to detect in the application layer. Um, I'll wait for Ganesh to talk more about the infrastructure section, but we do need to like triage this hardware, make sure that it actually is healthy, and then take things out of service uh, to prevent pods landing on them again. So we'll do a little demo, um, just going through like a basic job set with a checkpointing uh, like training script. Um, if this is going to play. So this is a pretty basic job set spec. Uh, it just has one pod template. Uh, it has 10 retries in the failure policy. It has DNS host names so that we can get a nice coordinator address. Uh, and when it scrolls down a little bit, we'll see we're just launching two, no two pods on two nodes. Um, they're each using eight GPUs and they're running a script, which we will see in one second. But the script is like the hello world of doing a sharded model on two nodes with some checkpointing. Uh, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> so it's literally like one layer, just doing like a dot product, nothing fancy. Um, but you'll see we are doing like uh, a sharded model, so we're sharding it across two nodes. Uh, we are initializing it with that job completion index, the job size, the coordinator address. We're setting up a checkpoint manager to save our progress. Uh, and then at the very end, uh, you'll see we're just doing a training loop for 30 steps, and we're going to have some bad luck with simulated failures to see what happens. Uh, let's see if it will go a little bit a hit. Cool. So we applied that. It's starting up. So let's see how much progress our job makes. We got three steps, and it failed. So we should have a checkpoint at step two. And ideally, we should recover that, and we found it. Nice. Looks like we got almost all the way, but we failed again. Hopefully, we make the last couple steps. <laughs> Some very bad luck. There we go. Okay, so we made our 30 steps. We finished our little training job. Um, and if we take a peek at what is inside this directory, we'll see that we have those last, it was a little bit cut off, but there are three directories, so the last three checkpoints that we saved. Uh, and you can see there's some data inside there with the sharding information and stuff like that. So nothing fancy, but this is kind of, uh, like I would say very standard, like ML kind of uh, loop. Um, so yeah. With that, I'll hand over to Ganesh to talk a little bit about the infra provider perspective. Thanks, Ace. That was great. From the infra provider perspective, we want to minimize the amount of failures that is surfaced to the end user. So we want to do as many checks and detections as possible before it actually runs a workload. There's different layers in which you can run these health checks, starting from initially when you physically get the GPUs and configure it on uh, your clusters. You can run checks to ensure that the GPU is healthy, and you can run performance testing of, to make sure that the network connections are appropriate as well. After that's done, uh, many infra providers also have a virtual machine deployment layer uh, as well. And in this layer, you can uh, perform checks before your actual orchestrators are allowed to use your GPU nodes. These could just actively run checks uh, so that any faulty nodes are taken out of circulation for inspection or other reasons. Then there's the orchestrator layer, which is the, the Kubernetes layer, or could also be other orchestrators like Slurm, where you want to run regular node health checks for just a node and GPU health. And then finally, at the workload layer, you could run things like init containers to check uh, the state of the, the GPU and the node right before you run your workload. Uh, in this section, we'll focus on the orchestrator aspect of it, uh, obviously because it's KubeCon, so we want to talk about what we can do to make it easier from uh, that perspective. There's two phases in which you can run these health checks, even at the orchestrator layer. One is you run checks initially before running the workload, and then the other side is you run health checks during the life cycle of your GPU and node. 
So initialization checks and issues can be detected through components like the device plugin, uh, which are checking things like the XID errors that are present. And uh, this is done in things like NVIDIA's uh, GPU device plugin. And then during the life cycle of the node, you can uh, run monitoring as well on the health of the GPU and look at various metrics that, that are being emitted. Uh, that screenshot is from the DCGM exporter. But then there's the other aspect during the life cycle where you can run <coughs> regular checks uh, and scripts through components like the node problem detector from Kubernetes. NPD is used widely across infrastructure providers and has a variety of health checks which add node conditions to your node. And that can be used by other components to uh, take actions as well. Uh, these are sample node conditions that uh, show up uh, by default. And here you'll see examples like node conditions for memory pressure or disk pressure and uh, pit pressure. But most of these checks are focused on issues at the kubelet level or the container D uh, level and a few other aspects. And none of these are GPU specific. So that's a big gap in the open source um, node problem detector uh, ecosystem. But the advantage of node problem detector is you can extend it with health checks. Uh, so some of the health checks that have been run by many users um, for a while, both in the HPC world and uh, by more advanced users of Kubernetes are custom health checks, which might be checking issues uh, for particular GPUs that are used widely. These could be cron jobs that are run regularly, uh, especially between training, training jobs. Or it could be running a, a tests like Lawrence Berkeley National Labs a Node Health Checks, which is open source and is known to be quite reliable and is widely used in the HPC world in particular. There's also other health checks like the Azure HPC health checks, which are also open source, and they run uh, specific health checks which extend LBNL's uh, checks and that are meant for uh, the GPUs that are supported by Azure. So these are some of the uh, health checks from that repo. You can see there's checks for things like GPU counts and uh, various types of bandwidth tests as well. And these can also be uh, categorized into tests which are not really impacting the workload and tests which can impact the workload, like some of the bandwidth-related tests. We'll see how these tests can actually be used to run with NPD. So as I mentioned before, NPD is very extensible, so you can add your own health checks. In this case, uh, we are. this is a very simple health check for counting the number of GPUs that are present on uh, on your node, and here you see a parameter which specifies how frequently this health check needs to run and what script to run, and that is defined in uh, this JSON file with, with the script as well. And this is another uh, NPD plugin for checking XID errors, for instance, and here's a list of XID errors are mentioned there. Maybe it's a bit hard to see for people at the back but then it's looking at the kernel log to check whether these XID errors are present um, and it's run periodically. So if, if these errors are present, then the node condition will be set to true uh, by node problem detector. And then you have the other component called the remedy controller, which can take actions to uh, mitigate and manage uh, the state of the node and the GPU. So there are many uh, remedy controllers available you could use things like Medicates, which is open source, or Drano, uh, to run these remediation actions, or you could also define your own components for uh, remediation. So, so what kind of actions can you take? Typically, it's around rebooting your node, or uh, resetting your GPU, or just draining your node and moving your workload to a different node. So once you do these actions, you can also uh, run these health checks again, and if there is no issue, then you can run the workload or move, um, move your workload to a different node. There's, so how do we test whether all of this works? You could run NVIDIA SMI commands to, uh, to, to, to modify the state of your GPU, or you could do some simulation with uh, networking by adding latency or limiting bandwidth, or you could also use tools like Kubernetes with that which allow you to 
create virtual nodes and uh, simulate the life cycle of uh, Kubelet without actually spinning up the GPUs and setting up all the networking. So in this demo, we'll see how we can put some of these components together and uh, see one simple example of a GPU issue. I'm creating a cluster on Azure Kubernetes service. This is adding an A100 GPU with A100 node with eight GPUs on it. And I'm skipping the driver installation because I'm gonna use uh, the GPU operator from NVIDIA to configure the drivers. So once that's done, we can uh, see all the various components of the operator and additional metadata that it adds uh, through, which, which is visible through kubectl I'll describe. And you'll see the node conditions which are present by default. Uh, this is in the earlier screenshot I showed. There's nothing GPU specific there. And I'm adding uh, the additional node problem detector plugins for GPU related issues along with a couple of infinite band ones. Once I run that, uh, we'll see that there are node conditions which show up for, uh, which are GPU specific. So one example you'll see there is the GPU count, and it says that the GPU count is correct. Uh, and the status is set to false. You'll see a few other node con conditions there as well. And then now I'm gonna be using Drano as the remedy controller. And the Drano spec is gonna just look at these specific uh, issues related to GPUs. So I'm specifying what I want to take actions on uh, for, uh, for Drano to look at. So we're running Drano now as well. And now I'm going to go inside the node and then try to uh, remove one GPU from that. So if we run NVIDIA SMI, we'll see there are eight GPUs visible. So these are from zero to seven. And now I'm going to drop uh, one of the GPUs, so disable persistent mode first, and then drain one GPU. Now we'll see that there are just seven GPUs present, zero to six. So this can have issues uh, downstream where if the application relies on there being eight GPUs, and if this is just a silent failure, that's gonna impact your workload negatively. You'll see some events as well that are produced by node problem detector, and you'll see the node condition, which will now be set to true uh, for G the GPU count. And it says that expected eight, but found seven GPUs. So that's a problem, and now Drano has to take actions to ensure that you don't schedule other workloads on it. And you'll see that scheduling's been disabled as well. Okay, one second, yeah. So just to recap, from ACES demo, we saw that you, can, you should checkpoint workloads, and then when there are restarts or issues, those can be uh, restored easily from those checkpoints. But if you just do that, it's possible that your pod will land on the same bad node again. And if there are GPU hardware issues, uh, you're gonna still have to deal with it, and it's not really solving the problem. But when you use NPD and Drano in conjunction with that, you can remove the bad hardware by ensure, and ensure that the same part does not land on that same bad node. So when you have both of these components working together, hopefully you'll have happy machine learning engineers. Definitely a high bar <coughs> to meet, but uh, that's the hope. And yes, this is a representation of how AI will be happy on Kubernetes if you put all of this together. And that's certainly a very accurate representation of the type of workloads you're running now. Just kidding. <laughs> now, now we'll talk about some advanced developments in this field and gaps in the ecosystem. One of the things is that we need to handle uh, GPUs in many separate ways, which makes it complicated. 
Uh, we don't usually have to think so much about CPUs and memories at this level, uh, because a lot of it has been solved through integrations and checks in many different components in the ecosystem. Uh, one, uh, an example of this could be like node problem detector upstream can make it easier to configure uh, health checks for GPU or make it standardized to run health checks uh, for single node uh, GPU issues. And then there's other aspects as well. When you have a cluster that runs different types of GPUs and also GPUs across different vendors like NVIDIA and AMD and you might have TPUs as well, you need to manage all these health checks and that can get pretty complex. Another very interesting area is around checkpoint and restore from the GPU perspective. Uh, there's a project with a very fancy logo, uh, Creo, and that's been there since around 2011, and it's been used for live migrating uh, CPU-based workloads. That checkpoints the entire state of the process that's running and allows you to migrate it. There is, uh, there are, there's work that's going on to support Creo for GPUs, and that uh, there's a project from NVIDIA called CUDA Checkpoint, which allows you to checkpoint the state of the GPU itself. And one main difference between this and just model-based checkpointing is this can lead to transparent checkpointing from the user perspective. So if this works uh, smoothly and reliably, then ideally you can manage um, like all of this from the infra side and you don't have to deal with checkpointing from the user side. If you can migrate your workload seamlessly in a, in a transparent manner. Um, but there's lots of challenges and gaps as well in this. One is how do you efficiently checkpoint the state of uh, potentially thousands of nodes, and how do you uh, properly deal with inter-node communication when there are failures, and appropriately save and restore that state? Uh, Microsoft has actually used it in, in production through this project called Sing Singularity. There's a nice a paper describing that approach as well. And they also have a component called device proxy, which intercepts calls to the GPU and eventually uses that for checkpointing and restoring. <laughs> but there's still lots more to be done in the space to make it easy for the end user to, uh, to checkpoint and restore. Uh, so this is a very interesting area. Cool. Um, so we talked about a bunch of things today. Um, what's missing? What else do we still need? Uh, so we've talked primarily about failure, but I would say that maintenance without uh, failures or, or like normal maintenance where you might just want uh, node image upgrades, driver upgrades, uh, any kind of OS tuning, uh, it's just as important. Um, and I think this is something that still in the Kubernetes world uh, is still kind of lacking, I would say. Um, Meta has a great blog article on how they do maintenance trains. Uh, you can also see Peter Solanke's talk from last KubeCon. Uh, they talk a lot about node lifecycle on Kubernetes and how they manage it with operators and controllers. Um, we've also mostly been talking about single node failures today. Um, I talked a little bit about networking issues uh, with multi-node, but I think in general multi-node testing is still pretty tricky, uh, especially if you have jobs running. Um, NVIDIA does have Megatron LM, which is like a real training workload that also helps kind of uh, highlight some of these failures. Nickel is fairly focused on communication, uh, not so much computation. Um, and then the last thing I would call out is the UX for batch is definitely rapidly uh, evolving still. I mentioned queue, job sets, leader worker sets. Um, those are all kind of like very active projects, uh, also relatively young projects, I would say. Um, and then just from like the device management, device plugin, CNI side, uh, there's still a lot of work going on there with like network operator, uh, as well as topology awareness, both within the node and across nodes for network topology. So what are the key takeaways from today? We learned how GPU failures can be very disruptive, particularly for training, uh, because of the synchronous nature of training and all the coordination that takes place. Then we described about health checks at various levels, starting from the application layer where you can run init containers for health checks and also some workload-specific checks. And then from the orchestrator layer, while running the GPU, you could use components like node problem detector for uh, detecting issues proactively and regularly. And you also use monitoring tools to add another layer of health checks. In terms of resolution, you do want to do checkpointing at the model layer, the model level, so that you can checkpoint and restore uh, weights across restarts. And then you can combine that with remedy controller systems, which look at uh, conditions like node conditions from NPD 
and take custom actions to either mitigate the issue or move, uh, move the workload to a different node. And you also want to make sure that you prevent uh, node reuse for faulty hardware. We touched upon some ongoing work in the space in terms of making GPU health checks more native to Kubernetes and transparent GPU checkpointing via Creo. And there's also work around smoother maintenance of uh, GPU upgrades as well that needs to be done. So with all of these approaches, we hope that your AI training systems can become significantly more resilient. And we are now open to questions as well. So thank you. His mics on both sides. Yeah. So, can you hear me? Yeah. Okay, awesome. Yeah. So uh, maybe this is a naive question, but like, why are we discussing so much on like Nvidia's failures? Like, why cannot that cannot be handled at the underlying hardware level or operating system level? Why <laughs> it is coming from the <laughs> application level? Uh, because I mean, I'm guessing CPUs also maybe having these issues and we don't notice it so often. Yeah. Yeah, that's that's a good question. And I think one is it's there's lots of new GPUs that are coming up and it's maturing up as well. So part of that is around reliability of the hardware that is initially provided as well. Uh, and then you know there's additional components as well that are present for GPU nodes. So uh, that is the first layer in terms of reliability. And then there's more checks that need to be done from um, various layers where you want to actively check uh, the state of the GPU. And many components, there's lots of checks by different components that are running uh, for CPU specifically. But because so many of these tools are just adapting for GPUs, we still need to do these checks. But the underlying stuff is the hardware quality itself and then uh, some uh, other issues that show up during the runtime we still need to proactively check. I would say NVIDIA probably does want, like they, they don't want to have a reputation for bad reliability, right? So it's definitely something I think they're aware of. Uh, but I think like the, the H100s in particular were pretty notorious for this. Um, but I know they have some improvements I think they're working on for future generations. So. Yeah. Yeah, nice talk. Uh, so your key takeaway, you mentioned uh, the proactive or the application specific check, like a vehicle check using maybe data containers. Can you comment more and elaborate a little bit more about the proactive approach? Because it seems to me and the most demo issue here is really the active approach. Yeah, I can take this one. Yeah, so I mean, I think uh, like node problem detector is detecting issues you know, after they've happened. Um, but as these nodes like are running workloads, like failures might happen uh, or like something might happen before the workload is actually running. So like ideally, you know, if a node is idle, you want to validate that it is good. Um, I think in the GPU, like HPC world, things are kind of flipped from CPU land. I think in CPU land, you assume that the node is good until you have an issue. I think in GPU, HPC land, it's kind of flipped. Like if we get new hardware, we assume it's bad until we validated it. Um, and if you know there's an issue, then we go and fix that first, so. Okay, thank you. Yeah. By the way, I'm from NVIDIA. <laughs> 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 Thanks for the talk. Um, on AKS, is there a way to um, share infinite band devices? Let's say if a node has multiple infinite band devices, can a pod request for a certain number? Uh, and if there is, can we also share a given infinite band device between multiple pods? Could you read this, the last part of that? Sorry. Um, if, if there is a way to actually request a certain number of infinite band devices, mm -hmm. can we also share one device between multiple uh, parts? Yeah. So, I mean, yes. I think the specifics will depend on, like, your CNI device plugin setup. Um, but if you look at what, like, network operator and, like, Multis have today. Um, so, I mean, for sharing devices, there is, like, Melnox has a shared, uh, shared HCA device plugin, I think it's called. Uh, there's also like a dedicated SRIOV device plugin plus CNI. So it depends like what setup you want, but one of those kind of can do either scenario, yeah, usually. Cool. And uh, is there something that AKS recommends today? Uh, those will work on AKS, yeah. I think there's, this is Lily, Lily's yeah, example, yeah, exactly. but you should, yeah, you should talk to it after, yeah. yeah. <laughs> we'll share the repo yeah. as well after the talk. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> hey, thank you for bringing up the CUDA checkpoint project. That's pretty fascinating for us in infra, because uh, it seems like it could solve a lot of problems. 
Do you know, is it like at the idea stage right now, or is it something you're actively trying to deploy? In your so this is a project from NVIDIA. Yeah. Oh, what I saw was they had the binary on the repo, and my understanding was that they're working on it, but I'd let someone from NVIDIA <laughs> comment on the state of, uh, <laughs> of that project. Okay. Yeah. There's also another project called Forensic Checkpointing from Kubernetes perspective, which allows you to checkpoint workloads. But I think the whole flow still needs to be smoother in terms of checkpoint and then restoring. Yeah, so I had a CUDA checkpoint question as well. Were you, you guys are not using that to do kind of on the fly repair of a job, or have you done that? So yeah, we are not uh, okay. right now. But the other project that I mentioned from Singularity that Microsoft has, um, let me. Yeah. Sure. So they have uh, the details on how they are actually using it. Yep. And there's also a demo uh, by uh, the CTO of Azure on how this could be used in production for checkpointing and moving the workload from one node to uh, another uh, and then restoring it. Yep. So that allows you to uh, preempt uh, certain jobs. If there's a higher priority job coming in, it allows you to checkpoint and restore. But they're using a different, uh, different set of tools for, for doing that. OK, there's a demo. Yeah, yeah, there's a demo online, and online. I can share the, the link. It's called Project Forge is the name of okay. the, the demo of how they're using it. And then okay. Thank um, you so much. this paper has the details on ex what yes. the components involved. So Super exciting. Awesome. Thank you. I, uh, thanks for the good presentation. So um, can you touch upon the effective training of uh, efficiency of the cluster? Um, you know, we've seen like different numbers today, like 90%. Lava, 97% core view. So when you have these kinds of errors, then how do you sort of uh, come up with, I mean, have you guys done like any? Uh, uh, I don't think we have a number off the top of my head that I could share. Um, those are certainly like good targets, I would say, the numbers that you've seen today. Like you, you generally want the cluster to be fully utilized because like you, usually you have almost unlimited work effectively. So like if you're not saturating it, something is wrong, right? Um, so I would say generally, like we don't have a lot of times where there's idle capacity because of problems, um, but it's something that like it's just like an SLA for any service, right? Like you want to have basically 100% uptime, which for ML means you're using new GPUs all the time, basically. So 